and uh, I would like to kind of start uh, my lecture. So you know, I'm sure you know, there are many, many questions. So one thing I want to do, if, you, if it's okay with you, I'm gonna present my lecture and I will, I will pause at a few moments so to ask a few questions and then we go ahead again. So, um, so if you have questions, you can also, by the way, as some of you have already done, type them in the chat, I can see them too. Um, but you know, if it's fine with you, uh, I would like to uh, start sharing my screen and uh, start my, my presentation. Um, and again, you know, it's wonderful to see you all. Uh, you know, people are here from uh, many, many parts of our, our universe, at least on planet Earth. And uh, it's great to tell you a little bit about black holes. So my name is Robert Dijkraaf. I'm uh, a theoretical physicist, and I'm also a director here at the Institute for Advanced Study. And, you know, the Institute is the place where uh, Albert Einstein uh, came in 1933 and they lived and worked here till his death in 1955 and so uh, we feel very much the home of uh, of relativity and Einstein's theory and I'm very happy to you know share some really exciting research that has happened in the last few years around black holes so the first thing I want to kind of uh, uh, remind you that you know if you throw up a ball up in the air you know, at some point it will fall down. And you can wonder, you know, how high can you throw a ball? Well, you know, if you it's calculate, you know, if you really are able to throw, as a child at least, a relatively fast baseball, it will go something like 50 miles per hour, like the speed of a, of a fast car. And if you throw it up in the air, it might go like 20 meters or something. And then it falls down again. And of course, the reason that it falls down is because there's gravity. It's very difficult to throw something very, very high because you have to fight the force of gravity. So the first question I want to kind of basically ask you, you know, can you throw a ball to the moon? Would it be possible? And how fast do you think you'll have to throw the ball? So does anybody has a suggestion? Unmute and just shout. Yes. It would have to have a protective surface, right? Because it would burn up. No, I, uh, but yeah, but it could be you know, any ball you pick, but how fast do you have to throw it? Or perhaps it's not possible. I don't think it would be possible to throw it, but you would have to, th you would have to get it in like the hundreds of miles per hour, wouldn't you? Excellent. So in fact, you have to, throw it with 25,000 miles per hour or 40,000 kilometers per hour. Uh, that's 30 times the speed of sound. So, you know, you have, a star, you have a fighter planes that goes with the speed of sound or twice the speed of sound the 30 times. So you need, that's why we need rockets with big, big, big boosts. So, no, there is, but it's possible, you know, if you have a very powerful gun, you could shoot a bullet to the moon. And of course, because it's very difficult to fight the gravitational force of the Earth. And in fact, if you go to a, a bigger planet like Jupiter, Jupiter is the largest planet in our solar system. You even have to go throw the ball if you want to throw it, say, from the Jupiter to, to Earth. You have to throw it with 60 kilometers per second. That's incredibly fast. And, you know, here you see the the planet earth here you see planet jupiter and this is the sun it's just see you know how small the earth is compared to the sun and to jupiter so suppose you were able to stand on the surface of the sun and you would wonder can i throw a ball all the way to a far far star or other galaxy now this the sun is so heavy has such a gravitational force that the escape velocity is even 10 times larger than of Jupiter. You have to throw it with 60 kilometers per second. Now, who knows what the fastest speed is that we can have? Unmute, if you know what the fastest speed is that you can have in physics. Speed of light. Like speed of light. The speed of light, exactly. And the speed of light is 300 kilometers per second. And no, 
for instance, I love this animation. Here you see the Earth and the Moon. And this is in real time. So if you would have a, a light beam going you know, from the Earth to the Moon with a little mirror and it would bounce up and down, it takes roughly a second to, uh, for light to go from the Earth to the Moon. So it's like a tennis game, right? So you could play a tennis game with somebody, one mirror on the Earth, one mirror on the Moon, and a light ray going from the other to the other. That's the fastest speed that you can. And if you, for instance, you look at this animation, you might say, well, I don't see anything happening. If you look carefully at the sun, you see a, a bit of light. Can you see it here? It's moving from the sun to the next planet, Mercury, to Venus, to the Earth. Who knows? Well, you can read it here. It takes eight minutes and 17 seconds for the mm -hmm. light to travel from the sun to us. So if you now go outside and you look at the sun, you see the sun, how it was eight minutes and 17 seconds ago. So actually, I find this light going extremely slow, right? It's almost like a snail. It's, it's crawling across my screen. And I'm not going to take eight minutes for this little dot to go from the left to the right. <laughs> so light is not going that fast. So the question is, you now can you make a star that's so heavy that the escape velocity, which was like 600 kilometers per second at the sun, is 300,000 kilometers so if, per second. So if the escape velocity is the speed of light, then light could not go. Now, if you would try to shine a light, it would be pulled in by the gravitational force of the star. And this would be a dark star. So astronomers worried about this already in the 18th century. The English uh, astronomer John Mitchell was the first one. The French Pierre Simon Laplace was the second one. They said, wait a moment, if you have really big stars, they might be dark. They might be so heavy that light could not escape and we wouldn't see them. So the question is, you know, how big should such a star be? Or there are two ways to make something, you know, the force of gravity very strong. One is to make a really big star. Another way is to compress the matter. So for instance, you could ask, suppose we take the Earth and we squeeze the Earth so that the gravitational force becomes stronger and stronger. How small should the Earth be before it becomes, let's call it, a black hole? So anybody an idea, how small should the Earth be in order to become a black hole? I hear an atom, I hear a marble. Marble is the right word. In fact, I have one of them right here. If you can look at my screen, you see here I have the earth reduced. So suppose I make the earth into a marble. It would still weigh as much as the whole earth, right? So it would not something that you could be, you couldn't, you, you would be like Atlas, you know, you would carry the whole weight of the, uh, of, of the earth if you would, but it would be this tiny. So if you would have a star where the earth is compressed to a marble, light could not escape. So people thought about this for a long time and then they essentially forgot it. And all of this came back when, uh, of course, this person that you all know, it's the most famous scientist ever, Albert Einstein. And, you know, Einstein started thinking about gravity and about the force of gravity. And, you know, how should we think about gravity? What actually makes something, you know, attract? And, you know, you might have wondered, I know that, you know, Gravity attracts a ball if I try to throw it, but how do you know that light also gets attracted by? So he did this by writing down an equation. And, you know, I will show you the equation. It's very difficult to understand. You have to uh, learn lots and lots of physics to see it. So I just want to write it because you know, it's actually not that complicated. So this was the equation he wrote. But I can explain it to you because what the equation is doing is essentially saying that space and mass have something to do with each other. And to explain this, I'm actually going to do a little experiment because especially for you, I, um, I brought a little black hole here in my office. Okay, so great. So here's my office and here's my surprise because 
here you see a black hole that I created for you. So I'm not going to explain how Einstein's theory of relativity works. And I hope you can hear me because I'm not wearing a mic. So, but I'll, so here I have a big piece of space and now I'm putting something heavy in it. So this is my example of say a planet. So suppose that this is the sun and I'm going to put it here. And what Einstein is telling us that if you put something in space, the space will be deformed, it will be curved. And so it's now curved. And so if it's not curved and I will take uh, a little ball, it just will go straight like this, right? It will just go across. But now see what happens if we put a big planet here. Now I'll take a ball and what will it do? It will go around. It, it tries to go straight. Orbit. Since no, I think it's orbiting. You can see that's going around. Can you all see? Let me do it once more. Orbiting. It's gravity, exactly. So if you have this little trampoline, you can understand how gravity works. Uh, and let me go back to my screen. So what we basically showed is that space and mass like each other very much. And so if you want to understand Einstein's theory, not in a formula, but in a slogan and explain this, this is the way to do it. There are two things that happen. The first thing is that mass will tell space how to curve. So we saw if you put something in space, space gets deformed, it gets curved. And the second thing is that space will tell mass how to move. If you want to go straight in this curved space-time, you certainly find out you're not going straight, but you're going into a circle. And as we saw, that's one way to think about how the moon orbits the Earth. And this is true for the moon, it's true for the Earth, it's true for all the stars and planets. And it's also true for light. If you take a light beam, it also will go in that curved space and it will deflect. And this was the idea that Einstein had. He said, you know, if you now look at the stars and you look at them, if the light goes very close by the sun, you will see the stars being moved. The trajectories of the stars are being moved. And people were able to do this experiment in 1919, almost 100 years ago, more than 100 years ago. They looked at the stars close to the sun and they took advantage of a solar eclipse. So the moment the moon was before the sun, you could actually see the stars here in the neighborhood, just behind the sun. And by carefully measuring, they could see that indeed their positions had moved and that light was deflected by gravity. And by carefully measuring this, they could see that Einstein's theory was right. Now, nowadays we have much better telescopes and we can see this effect, you know, much more spectacular. For instance, you know, if you look at a galaxy very far away and there's an other galaxy close by, then actually you can see, it's almost like looking through a laughing mirror. You see, you see very complicated images. Like here you see all these streaks and all these very funny things. That's what we call a gravitational lens. So gravity is like almost like it's a glass, uh, a glass lens that is deforming the light. So when people found this out, Einstein became really, really famous. And I want to show you a little clip because he also traveled to the United States. And when he came here, he was a really big celebrity. And so here you can see Albert Einstein being welcomed actually in New York City. Germany is the greatest city of the world. I'm delighted. I'm delighted. What do you think of prohibition? 
Professor? Ich trinke nicht, also ist mir das ganz gleich. Professor, a freude to see you here in America, wieder zu sein. Wenn ich sie sehe, sicher. So Einstein was very happy uh, to come here. And in fact, in 1933, he came to Princeton and here you see him walking. Uh, you know, for those of you who live in Princeton, so you might recognize this, the Institute for Advanced Study. There were less trees there. He is he in front of his blackboard in his room, not this room, but the next one up there. He's writing his famous equations. And uh, here he's in the library. And actually, if you come to IAS, it's now closed, unfortunately, then actually you will be uh, you know, seeing the same books that Albert Einstein read. Well, you know, soon after Einstein uh, wrote down his equations, um, there's this professor, Carl Schwarzschild, that found a solution. And I'm just writing down here the solution of the equations. It looks complicated, but not that complicated. And actually, that was the solution of a black hole. So you should imagine, you now you saw the little trampoline and I put a ball there, but suppose I put a very big bowling ball in it. Then actually it will go all the way through and it will rip up space and time. And that's what Schwarzschild found. There is a solution, what we now call a black hole, which you should think of, you know, you take a star and the star collapses and it gets squeezed all the way to a point. And that point we call the singularity. So you should imagine not taking the Earth and collapsing it to a marble, but all the way to a point. Now, what happens if you have such a singularity? It's surrounded by a space that we call the event horizon. And the thing is, you know, if you're outside that area, you're fine. So there's a safe area outside the horizon. But if you go inside, it's kind of a no-go area. You're doomed. You will be pulled into the black hole. And the way to think about this, if you're at the event horizon, that's exactly where the gravitational force is so strong, it will just about keep the light in. If you go slightly outside, the light can escape. If you go slightly inside, the light will be pulled back in. And I like this metaphor. So you should imagine, you know, this is like a water hole. So it's a sinkhole and the, it's like a waterfall, but the water is kind of flowing inside and it's going faster and faster. And you're in a little boat and the boat has a little engine. And of course the boat doesn't, can go very fast. So there is a moment where you're still safe because your boat goes faster than the river flowing inside. If you pass that horizon, if you pass that kind of area, the kind of a point of no return, you will be pulled in because you know, however fast you try to escape, you will not be able to go faster, in this case, than the water. So that's, that's something quite remarkable, that black holes have this area around it, this sphere that we call the event horizon, that in some sense tells you, as long as you stay outside that sphere, you're fine. Now, we already, you know, there's a formula for it. And we already said that, you know, it would be roughly the size of a marble. But, you know, what would happen if the sun would become a black hole? Anybody idea how big that black hole would be if the sun would become a black hole? Any idea? Tennis ball. A tennis ball. An orange. An orange. A bowling ball. A bowling ball. Uh, in fact, it's pretty a big. Ball. It's roughly three uh, kilometers. Uh, so it's it's as big as Manhattan, which is like big for us, but you know, for a star, that's really tiny. So uh, a, a, a solar black hole, a black hole formed from the sun or from, from a star will be the size of a big city. Um, so it, if it actually would be you know, close to us, you know, of course it would have an incredible gravitational force. 
Um, and then we'll come in a moment to black holes that are even larger. Now, before we have some time for questions, I want to raise one more point. So I'm sure some of you have seen this movie, Interstellar. And, you know, there was a giant black hole there. And when the astronauts were close to this black hole, here you see a beautiful picture of the black hole, something very strange happened. Does anybody remember who saw the movie, what happened if you came close to the black hole? It was dangerous. Why was it dangerous? I know why it's dangerous. Why? Because time slowed down by a lot. Time slowed down, exactly. Each so, hour was like seven years. Exactly. So if you get close to a black hole, if you get close to the horizon, so you won't be pulled in, you can still survive, but something very strange happens to time. So suppose here I'm outside and time is going you know, really fast, just as it goes here. If you would be close to the black hole, time would, care, would, would, look, would go very slow. I have to explain this. You wouldn't notice this if you're close to the black hole. But if I'm on the outside and I'm looking at you, you actually look like you're in slow motion. You move very, very slow. You don't feel this, but for us on the outside, it looks very strange. It's like, wait a moment, who messed up with time? Now, it's very difficult to explain this, but one way to explain this, for those of you who know a little bit more physics, you can imagine, you know, if you try to send light away, so for instance, this blue light ray, of course, you have to be outside the horizon, but outside the horizon, you send this blue light ray, it has to travel all the way, and it has to, it has to basically lift itself out of what we call this gravitational well. It has to escape uh, the, the force of gravity. Now, light always travels with the same speed, but it can actually lose energy. And if light loses energy, it changes its color. So the blue light, if it will escape, it will look red. And one way to think about it, it's mm -hmm. oscillating, it's, it's moving slower. It's, you know, it's a vibration and the vibration slows down. So if you have a bunch of clocks, like in this beautiful animation, you see that if the clocks are getting closer and closer to the horizon, they're getting slower and slower and slower. And if you put a clock at the horizon, it will be frozen. And this actually is quite interesting because many people would ask, you know, what happens if I fall into a black hole? Well, if you fall into a black hole, you will be squeezed to a point. You will be totally destroyed. And you know, this, it's not a funny story. It's really, really very dramatic. The question is for us who are sitting on the outside, what will we see? And so what we will see, we see you slow, we see you falling into the black hole. And then when you get very close to the horizon, you start to slow down, you start to freeze, and you go slower and slower. And basically, we never ever see you falling through the horizon. You, you, you'll be frozen like you're, you're watching a movie on, on the internet, you know, and the, the speed is, the internet connection is very bad, and certainly the image freezes. That's, that's what you will see. So let's stop here for a moment. What would a camera see in that? I know what we would see, but what would a camera see? If so the the video. camera, if, you, if you're in the spaceship, you wouldn't even yeah. notice that you passed the horizon. You we can actually pass the horizon right now. So if you're on the camera, nothing happens. Answer nothing question. happens. So if you're looking into a camera lens, you'll just regularly see it. You mean if you look at outside, what you see on the other side? No, like if you're outside the horizon, you have a, you know, like taking a video of someone inside the horizon, will you that cannot. look you regular cannot. to the you camera? Can... No. To because... you when you look into the camera, or will it look the exact same? No, you cannot look inside the horizon because now if you look with the camera, say to me, actually what you are seeing, you're seeing the light that I emit, right? So this light here that comes from my window, it bounces off my face. And then it goes to your eye or to your camera. If you're in, if I inside the black hole, the light cannot escape. 
So the only thing I can see is the area very close to the horizon. But if you, the things that are very close to the horizon, they move at very slow speed. So for instance, if I would fall into a black hole, I would start talking slow like that. So the, the moment, suppose it takes me, I've tried to fall into black hole, it takes me say 10 seconds, then that 10 seconds is stretched to an eternity. Are there other questions about this? So it wouldn't change even if you were looking at through a video? Yeah, it doesn't change whether you use a video, if you think you're fast, you know, you do a cable or you do an internet or a radio. Uh, you always have to communicate with the outside. So whether it's light or radio or electricity, none of it will work. So you can't, you can't shoot a movie. Now you can fall into a black hole and have a wonderful experience and you know, learn a lot. But you will not be able to tell us. So if we are so close to black hole, but not being pulled into it, we could stop our aging, right? Yes, we could start oh, quite great. at the edge. <laughs> so you can explore, and there's a lot of questions. You know, what happens if you're close to the horizon? But you know, as we've seen in the movie Interstellar, it's very costly because you know it will. Uh, it will take a lot of time, you, you know, you, you might spend an hour close to the horizon of a black hole. Um, but for us, that could take a thousand years. So you come back and then, you know, you won't recognize anybody on the planet because, you know, they're all, history has moved on. So, so somebody who is outside the black hole for that person, anything falling in the black hole? never goes beyond the surface of the black hole exactly purposes. exactly so you might think what happens if you you actually pass the moment the moment you pass the horizon you can never see because it takes an infinite amount of time for us um right so, so again, all the so all the mass that fell in for an observer outside that mass is literally sitting at the surface forever of the black hole exactly Exactly. It's, it's, it's I'm still frozen in there. Yes. What if I'm in... So it's really exciting. What if I'm in the hole? So if you're in the hole, of course, you know, there's a very strong force of gravity. And at some point, you will be pulled into the center. You cannot stop it. But if it's a really big black hole, you know, you could live for a long time inside. You no, know, it's... Um, it, it, you, you, it could, uh, if you're a gigantic black, we could be inside the black hole now. We, we might not even know it. Rachel, you have a question. Is... Rachel? <laughs> My question is, if when you're looking into the black hole, time slows down. Yes. When you look out of the black hole, <clears throat> So if I'm inside the black hole looking at you outside, would you look like you're in higher speed? Would I be able to like see you faster? Yes, exactly. So, you know, as we said, uh, you know, if you, the light that escapes, that slows down, its speed slows down, or not the speed of light, but the, 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 the rate at which the movie images move. At the same way, you would see it's kind of being sp sped up. Okay. And it gets the black hole look 2D if you're on the side of it? Like, because when I, because when you see pictures, you just see like a circle and you never actually see the side. Or is it just a giant, like, is it like round or is it basically looks 2D? That's a good question too. Uh, actually, we come to a moment. You know, of course, everything uh, looks looks two D if you um, because your eye is two dimensional, so you see it. Uh, and here, actually, we're looking at a picture of a black hole. I hope you can see it. But the important thing is the horizon is a sphere, so it's all round. So it's like a glass or a dark ball that goes around. So what I want to do, I want to stop the questions, you know, save your questions, we'll come back. And I now want to talk about the black holes that are actually out there in space. 
Uh, before we do that, uh, I want to travel with you a little bit into space. So let's do that. And here we go. We, uh, I think we start in New York. We're traveling. So we're zooming out. So here's the Earth. Uh, it's nicely rotating. Here's the solar system. Here are the other planets. Here's the sun. And now we are moving through, uh, through space, through the cosmos. And you see all these little dots are stars. So you now we are moving through, here you see clouds. These are clouds where stars are being born. All these little spots, these are not snowflakes. These are actual positions of physical stars in our Milky Way. Here is another uh, famous uh, nebula. And here you see, by the way, a nebula, which is we are not going to move through it because this is a place where actually a star exploded. And inside that little cloud is a black hole. And here you see all the stars in the Milky Way in our galaxy. And here I'm stopping the movie. Uh, and you will move it in, a, in, in, in another time. Now, how can you see a black hole? So if you look at this movie, you see it's a black hole. And the black hole itself, so let's, let's go back for a moment. Oh, sorry, there we go. So it's very difficult to see a black hole because it's black. But if a black hole gets close to another star, it might do something really bad. So let's see whether I can start this movie. Here it goes. So here is a star coming. And the black hole actually eats it up. You know, it takes all the matter of the star. It tries to swallow it. And you see that around the black hole, there is this ring, this kind of, um, this kind of uh, disk of matter that's rotating and that's falling into the black hole and you know because it's rotating very fast it shoots out light and that's why we can see black holes the black hole itself is dark but the light falling in before it actually goes through the horizon it can actually uh, you know uh, make this ring now some of you have seen this image perhaps also in the movie interstellar so this is how such a ring looks like. Because remember, the black hole is like this gravitational lens. So you're not seeing a, a disk. You see something that's really warped because you have the force of gravity is bending the light around. And so if you would, I love this animation. Here you see a black hole with this uh, beautiful disk around it. And it's moving through space. And while it's moving through space, here you see it, uh, you know, it's also distorting the stars around it, right? Because it's this very, very strong gravitational lens. And here you're seeing it is a black hole is moving through a galaxy and it's changing the positions of the stars. So this is like Einstein's experiment of the eclipse, but now uh, of course, much more spectacular. And you see the hot gas, the plasma, all the material of the star that the black, black hole swallowed going around. So that's really exciting. So one way we can look for black holes is to look at objects in the night sky that have this you know, radiation coming out of it because they are trying to swallow other stars. But there's not a place where you can look for, uh, for black holes. And that's like in the centers of galaxies. So one exciting discovery that is in each galaxy there appears to be a black hole a black hole that is not a the weight of a single star but of millions of billions of stars so it weighs like a billion times or a million times the mass of the sun and particularly this is true in our own milky way so this is the milky way um you know the earth uh, oh, sorry, the sun is here. That's wrong, it should be here. Uh, so, you know, we are living in the Milky Way. We're not living in the center. If you think about our position in this galaxy, it's like we're living in the suburbs. 
So in the center of the galaxy is really exciting. So you can imagine in the center is like a big city. And uh, so the center of the galaxy will be, our, our galaxy will be like New York City. And in our, our neighborhood is more like Princeton. And it turns out that in the middle of our own Milky Way is a, what we call a supermassive black hole. It's called Sagittarius A star. And uh, because actually, if you look into the sky, it's positioned in the, uh, in the astronomical sign of Sagittarius. And so this is a really big black hole. So remember, if a sun or a star becomes a black hole, it will be basically the size of New York City. So now the question is, how big is this black hole? Have anybody any suggestion? How big is the black hole that's inside our Milky Way? In the oh, no, I don't the size of um, the solar system. The size of the solar system. Can I ask a question? Um, how big? Is if there's a if there's a black hole at every center of every galaxy, does that mean that like it's eventually going to like suck all the stars into itself? Because if it has such strong gravity, I will let me talk about it in a moment. Indeed, no, we don't know how these black holes became so huge. Probably because they swallowed a lot of lot of stars. But you know, it's a little bit if you are, you know, your take your vacuum cleaner and you start to vacuum a part of your carpet. You will suck up all the dust in that region. You will not suck up the dust, you know, in other rooms because the vacuum cleaner is not that strong. So it has cleaned the neighborhood a little bit, uh, but it will not suck up uh, at the moment all the other all the other stars. But coming back to the question, I think I hear the good good answer. Somebody said as big as the solar system. Well, I would say our Milky Way is not so big and our black hole is not that big, but here is our solar system. You see the inner planets, Mercury, Venus, the Earth and Mars. In the, the middle is the sun. The black hole in the Milky Way is, um, is roughly this size. So it is, it's much bigger than the sun, but it's roughly one tenth the size of the orbit of Mercury. If you want to imagine it here again is the sun and Jupiter and Earth. So remember, compared to planet Earth, Jupiter is gigantic, but the sun is even much bigger. But in order to see this supermassive black hole, we have to shrink the sun to this size over here. And then this will be the size of our galactic black hole. So it's much, much bigger than the sun, but it's not as big as the whole solar system. And if you want to look at it, you have to look indeed in the night sky, and you look, have to look at the center of the galaxy. Now, again, we are not in the center of the galaxy. So it's actually in the Southern hemisphere. So you have to travel to like Latin America in order to see it nicely or Africa. And if you look in the constellation of Sagittarius and you zoom in, so here you see the Milky Way, here you see the center of the Milky Way. If you zoom in, the center looks very beautiful. You have this, this is uh, also a depiction of the radio wave. So it's a violent place. There are lots of stars compressed, a lot of explosions. No, it's like, it's really like a big city. A lot of things are going on, a lot of violence, a lot of uh, excitement, uh, very different than our neighborhood of the galaxy. And if you zoom even further in, you see these clusters of stars that are very close together here. And if you zoom even further in, this is what you see. You see they moving. They orbiting something. Now this movie has speed up. This took like 10 years to make this movie. But you see that the stars at the very center of the Milky Way are moving much faster than any other stars. Like our sun is orbiting the Milky Way. It takes 200 million years for it to go around once. These stars go around in say 10 or 20 years. And you no know, astronomers looked at them very carefully, and you see here you see their orbits, and you see uh, you know this the, the time is flowed. So this is 2003, 2004, 2005. Some of you might have been born around this time, and so for more than 20 years, astronomers have been following these orbits of the stars, and this is like a solar system 
where you don't have planets moving around the sun, but you have stars moving around the black hole. And you know, this is extremely exciting research. And this year or last year, the Nobel Prize in Physics, at least one half of it, was awarded to uh, two astronomers, Reinhard Genzel from Germany and Andrea Guess from uh, Caltech, uh, for doing this work. We're basically proving that there is a black hole in the center of our Milky Way. Does anybody have a question about this black hole, the one in the center in the Milky Way? Way. Does the like does the black hole make all the stars in the Milky Way orbit? No, I think it's so. Again, the black hole is like a million stars, but our Milky Way is a hundred billion stars. So there are many more stars. So only a very small part of the mass of the galaxy is inside this massive black hole. Uh, still, it's very big. It's swallowed like a million stars. And, you know, sometimes we see these, these black holes eating up a new star. And we see a big flash of light, in fact, of X-rays in the, in the cosmos when it swallows another star. So some of these stars you saw came pretty close by. And it could be that, you know, we, we see one of them uh, being eaten recently. But it takes like one, it eats perhaps like one star a year or something. No, it, uh, and most of the stars are safe. We are safe. There is no way in which uh, that black hole can eat the sun. How was this black hole born in the first place? How these black holes were formed in the first place, we do not know. Uh, you know one of the big questions is, were they born like that when the stars were formed, were the black holes there already? Um, we recently, just this month, people found a huge black hole inside a very, very young galaxy, a galaxy that was only a few hundred million years old. And so it wouldn't have had enough time to grow. So some of our astronomers think that perhaps they were there from the very beginning. Um, on the other hand, you know, we see them growing. We see black holes merging. So this is still completely open. Uh, so inside the event horizon of a star, is there like sound like I couldn't escape because if light can't escape, then sound would have no chance of escaping. Exactly. But like, is there sound inside of the black hole? Yes, if you're inside the black hole, and again, you know, if you have so galactic black hole, it's really big. It's, you know, it's, uh, it's the size of a, a part of our solar system. So if you're inside the horizon, Life just looks normal. You know, you're just pulled in. You know, you can't escape. So you, you're drifting towards the center. But physics is ordinary physics. So you can talk. You can uh, see things. However, how, how hard you shout, however hard you shout, or shine a light, or make an explosion, none of it will ever escape the horizon. All of it, even the sound the waves, will be pulled into the black hole. But where do you go? I mean, if you're sucked into the black hole, where do you go? Do you like? That's a very good question. We don't know the answer. There's something we're investigating. Uh, but the, what happens at the singularity is a big mystery. In fact, Einstein's theory breaks down. And that's why Einstein really hated black holes, because it showed that his, his theory, his equations, weren't complete. No, weren't the final answer. So we don't know. Okay, I want to stop the question for a moment. And you know, we, 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 we talked about, can we see black holes? We saw them indirectly. Now I want to ask the question, can we hear a black hole? Now the question is, how can you hear gravity? Well, yeah. you think, you know, what we will say gravity is. Gravity is essentially the deformation of space and time. And so, you know, if you think about space is a little bit like a drum, if you hit it, and you can, for instance, hit space by moving your arm, you will create what we call gravitational waves, small oscillations in space that will travel. Now, if I wave my arm very hard, the gravitational wave will be very, 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 very dim, and it's impossible to measure. But if you, for instance, have two very strong stars or two black holes that are orbiting each other, that will create very violent gravitational waves. 
And so Einstein theory predicted this. And so the question is, can we hear these gravitational waves? And in order to do so, um, and this must be a project for many, many decades, people built an observatory, a LIGO observatory. The, it's, a, it's an observatory that basically consists of two ears. One is in, um, uh, in uh, Washington state, and the other one is in um, Louisiana. And these two ears, you can see a little bit in this in this animation. So what they exist of of two long arms, and what happens is that you know light is bouncing up and down these arms, and if a gravitational wave passes this observatory, it will squeeze the arms a little bit, and by squeezing the arms, you can measure that a gra gravitational wave passed along. So that's the theory. And then something really excited happened on the 14th of September in 2015, because that was the moment, the first time a gravitational wave was detected. You can't see it, but you can hear it. So let's listen to this gravitational wave. Here it is. I hope you can all hear it. I repeated it. So. It's this is the sound of a gravitational wave passing the Earth. And so, of course, everybody was wondering what made this signal? Where did it come from? And it's pretty exciting. Now, this signal was coming not from a single black hole, but from two black holes that actually merged. And here's an animation of what happened. So it's a little bit slow down. You see two black holes, they're orbiting, and then they collapse to make another black hole, a bigger black hole. So let's see it again. Now, this was a tremendous explosion. It was actually the biggest explosion that we have ever witnessed in the cosmos. But lucky for us, it happened very far away, and so also very long away. In fact, it happened 1500 uh, million years ago. So this was, you know, at a time where there weren't even dinosaurs on planet Earth. And this signal then traveled all that time, just, and we recreated that big observatory and we measured uh, this collapsing black hole. So now we know for sure that black holes exist. We also know that black holes can uh, collapse together and we can measure them. And in fact, now, now there are more of these gravitational waves observatories. There's one in Italy called Virgo. There's one in Japan called Kagra. There's another one uh, in India that will come online. And unfortunately, because of the COVID crisis, they stopped measuring. But the lovely thing is, you know, there is an app. It's called Gravitational Wave Events. I have it on my smartphone. And it gives you an alert merger. So isn't that exciting? You know, if an explosion goes out somewhere in the far away galaxy, you know, I have a little app and I get a little alert. Basically, the universe sends a text message to me that, you know, uh, black holes. And you know, you list uh, this was, you know, a uh, uh, recent events. And you see, well, you know, there is a... Uh, at a certain moment when something happens and you can see the, these events here uh, you know and i must say i love that that's you know quite exciting uh, unfortunately they stopped uh, uh, some of them stopped measuring but you no know, you see here there's a black hole uh these these are two neutron stars colliding it happened on the 29th of january here you see two black holes colliding it happened on um uh I think this is the 3rd of November, no, 11th of, of, uh, of February. So, you know, they're measuring these things and isn't that really exciting? So I think you should all uh, in, in, uh, put this, uh, I know some of your parents might say, you know, don't spend too much time on your phone, but actually if it's listening to the universe, I think it's, it's okay with me. I think Einstein would approve for that. Uh, any questions about these uh, gravitational waves?
I have a question regarding what you just have mentioned. How much time, according to your information, it takes for two black holes to be collided? Yeah, so the animation you saw was slow down. It happens essentially, well, first of all, they spin around forever. But the, the moment which becomes exciting, so the last moment when they start spinning faster and faster and colliding, it typically takes a millisecond. So it's one thousandth of a second. So they start spinning since the, their birth, right? We don't know. So one of the amazing thing is that we find these big black holes, they're quite close together. And the question is, how can you make two black holes close together? Did one black hole capture another one? Did a black hole capture a star and then ate up the star and then the other star became a black hole too? There are many theories. And to be completely honest, I think we're all still confused. So, uh, and some of these black holes are big, like the black holes uh, that are, can be 20 or, or 30 times uh, the, the mass of the sun, much, much bigger than we thought they could exist. How can you okay, determine thank you. Uh, that uh, the wave that we receive is due to black holes? Thank you, that's a wonderful question. So I just, you know, we just listen to it. But of course, we've, we have a very careful measurement of the shape of the wave. And so then the question is, if you have two black holes and they collide, what kind of wave will they produce? And this is only something that has been solved recently because you need very, very powerful computers in order to calculate it. And you need very sophisticated theory. In fact, uh, one of my colleagues here at Princeton, Franz Pretorius, made the breakthrough exactly the um the shape of uh of that wave and uh and it perfectly matches the signal that we measured so we know quite we can actually hear what is the size of the two black holes we can hear how they are oriented we can even hear how they exactly of their spinning and how they fall into each other's arms. Um, when when in the animation that we just saw, did the did the black hole, uh, just did it did it like swallow up the other black hole or did they just combine together? Um, you no. Know, I, they combine together. Perhaps one black hole will say that it swallowed the other, but the other could also say that it swallowed the one. So uh, they uh, they fall basically and they create uh, a, a bigger one. So it's a little bit like uh, you know, yeah, it's just adding two and you know, just as uh, you know, uh, as you could add you know two uh, two snowballs to make a bigger snowball. Um, I have a question. Go ahead. Um, if you have two black holes that collide and make one big one, why is like the like like area of the event horizon of the big one bigger than the like sum of the event horizons of the two small ones? Because I heard that, but I'm not really sure why that is. So there are two things that we know. So one thing is that you know the the size of the of the black hole so measured as in terms of the diameter is proportional to its mass so if you have a black hole that's twice as heavy it's twice as big um, there's something else that says that the horizon the area of the horizon uh, can never be more than the sum of the two other horizons. But, um, uh, you know, that actually, these two facts are consistent. So I think for us most important is that, um, by the way, by if these two black holes collide, they lose also a little bit of energy. In fact, they lose so much energy that basically at the collision, three times the mass of the sun was converted using Einstein's equals mc squared into gravitational radiation. So in fact, the, at that moment, the power of the explosion, the amount of energy coming out of the collision was more than all the stars in the whole visible universe together. 
So if you could see gravitational waves, it would be a flash that would kind of blind all other radiation in the universe at that moment. What is the practical usefulness of this scientific knowledge about black hole? Like can <laughs> to develop some products or something on Earth? <laughs> uh, I, I, I think black holes themselves have very little relevance. But of course, you know, the technology in order to build these detectors is uh, used everywhere because these LIGO observatory is the most sensitive instrument that we know. You know, I think it has been compared as measuring the distance from here to the next star up till uh, the width of a hair. So the, if you want to think of this result as a, as a calculation, it's they computed the number where there are 21 decimals that were computed. So it's the most sensitive instrument and the technology needed for that instrument, the lasers, the quantum measurements is being used at many other different things. So I want to move on and the last chapter of my presentation, we have talked about how we can hear black holes now I want to ask, can we see black holes? And I want to go back and I want to go to the biggest black hole that we know that exists. So let's start this movie again. So here is our Milky Way, you know, it's massive. It has a hundred billion stars. But now we're zooming out and look outside, you see, these are not stars, these are other galaxies. There are a hundred billion galaxies in our visible universe. This is the Triangulum galaxy. It's our nearest neighbor. Uh, there you see the Andromeda Nebula and you see many more galaxies. And you notice that our Milky Way is not the largest. Our Milky Way is also not really very central. So I said our Milky Way was New York City. That's not really true. It's, uh, you know, it's uh, perhaps more like, uh, you know, a smaller city in the United States. The real, the real big player here is this galaxy out here. It's called M87. It's much bigger than the Milky Way. In fact, here you see a picture of it. It's 55 million light years away. So the, the light that we see from this galaxy took 55 million years. So that's just after the, the dinosaurs were wiped out. So if we look at that galaxy, we're basically looking at the time at the, around the end of the, gal uh, of the dinosaurs. And just to see in comparison, here you see the Milky Way at the same scale. So this M87 compared to the Milky Way is a little bit like you know Earth, compared to the sun. So this is a much bigger and a much older galaxy. It's not a, it's not a disc, it's what you call an elliptical galaxy. And inside this uh, galaxy is a black hole that is much bigger. Now the, the black hole in our Milky Way was like a million solar masses at eight, basically a million stars. This is 6.5 billion solar masses. And if you want to imagine how big that black hole is, here you see the solar system. Uh, you know, this yellow orbit is Pluto. And here you see the Voyager um, satellites that were, you know, they, they left Earth in the 1970s, 80s. They travel now outside the solar system. So they are the furthest that anything man-made has gone. And so if you want to see how big this black hole is, it's the biggest black hole that we know. And so here you see it. So easily the whole solar system could fit inside it. It's, uh, it's roughly three, four times bigger than our solar system. It has a radius of 20 billion kilometers. So it's the biggest black hole we know, but of course it's still very far away. So the question is, if you want to look at it, how, how small is it? You know, how big a telescope should you make? So, and one way to think about it, so I joked in the beginning, you know, when we have these family science talks here, you know, at the Institute, we usually start with big, with uh, donuts. We don't, I don't have donuts for you, but I have a donut on my screen. 
if you want to look at this black hole, it's like looking at a donut, but on the moon. So can we build a telescope, see a donut on the moon? I think that is the question. Uh, another way to put this, if you would have such a powerful telescope, you could read, you know, from United States, you could read a newspaper in China. Or, you know, I could look with that telescope at your finger and you could see the atoms in your finger. So if you could build a telescope like this, it has to be incredibly powerful and it has to be really large. So my question to you is how big should that telescope be in order to see this black hole close up? Any idea how big that is? That, that, the size of the earth? Size of the earth. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's the size. Is, is this size invisible of the light? Yeah. Is this a telescope that uses visible light or other wavelengths? That's a very good question. So the tell actually, in order to see a black hole, uh, you need to see the 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 matter that's orbiting around it, and the best way to look at that is using radio waves in fact uh kind of high frequency radio waves and they are uh they are uh you know they're part of the electromagnetic spectrum so not visible light the, the visible light will actually you know not go through this very dense center of the galaxy you really have to look um using radio waves so it's a radio telescope but the the, the answer was correct you need to build a telescope the size of the planet and at this moment i would give up but my colleagues did not and mm -hmm. so they built that thing and the way they did it is by putting radio telescopes you know all over the earth even on the south pole on the north pole you know in the desert of chile on hawaii on in spain and all connect them and making a virtual radio telescope that's essentially the size of the earth. And using this instrument, this is like the biggest telescope ever built. And so they were actually to zoom in into the night sky closer than any time before. And there's a beautiful animation. Uh, by the way, on the, on, the, on the bottom, you can see all these radio telescopes, right? So there are these dishes. Um, there's a large collection here, Alma which is in Chile. In fact, that's a very important note. It's very, very careful. Um, and here is the, 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 the radio telescopes that are on Hawaii. Uh, also, they, these are all on high mountains um, so that there is not, not much interference. And they all looked at that particular part of the night sky. And um, now they, they needed a cloudless night in fact, they needed a week of clear vision in April, I think, 2018 or 17. And, you know, you need good weather, all, all these locations. So they were extremely lucky. They had good weather around the Earth because you can imagine, you know, there are always clouds somewhere. Now, all of these locations are, are places where typically the, eye is very, the, the, the air is very dry, but still they were very lucky. They had four days, four nights of observation, and this is what they saw. So here is an animation, and you can you, we are zooming in in the night sky. Now we're not zooming in in the center of the Milky Way. We're zooming in in the center of this other galaxy, M87, which is in Virgo. There it is. We zoom in, we zoom in. There you see. And that's what they saw. They saw this very, very beautiful image. Here it is. And this is the first picture of a black hole. Now, again, you're just to imagine our solar system would easily fit into the hole here in the middle. Of course, we're not seeing the black hole. We're seeing the matter that's orbiting the black hole. 
and we see the light or actually the radio waves being emitted by the matter that's about to fall in into the black hole. And again, this is a gigantic black hole. This is the biggest monster that we know of uh, in the night sky. And it's also uh, the biggest one to see. So it's not an accident that you saw the first picture of this object because it's in some sense the easiest to photograph. Uh, the next one that people are still looking at, we haven't seen yet, is the black hole in our own Milky Way. It, that black hole is smaller, but the Milky Way, the center of the Milky Way, is closer by. Basically, that, that uh, Milky Way black hole, Sagittarius, is a thousand times closer by, but is also a thousand times smaller. And so it would probably be a very similar image. Now, when this image was uh, shown, uh, it appeared, you know, on all the front pages of all the newspapers. So you probably, you probably have seen it somewhere. And um, in fact, you know, I, I, just for your amusement, uh, I, I, a few years earlier in 2016, I was asked to uh, paint a mural in the black hole center at, uh, at Harvard University. And I painted the black hole and I tell, told them, well, you know, I'm just, this is my artist imagination. And, you know, when you actually make a real picture, I will come and I will repaint the black hole. But you see, I was pretty close. Uh, so, uh, of course, I used the scientific theory. So um, it's, it's really exciting that we uh, could find it. So um, I, I'm coming to the end of my presentation. There's one more thing I want to say, and then I'll open it for questions, is that you know, we have seen that you know, black holes exist. Um, you know, they are, in some sense, um, everywhere. There are in uh, the many stars that turn to black hole. When we listen to gravitational waves, the first thing that we hear is colliding black holes. If we look into our galaxies, we see these massive black holes in the middle. They are the most violent. They eat up stars. Nobel prizes are being given to uh, the detection of black holes. Um, and, 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 and so you might say, what's there to be discovered? Well, it's a very paradoxical object because you know black holes. There are so many questions around it. And one question that is really, that many people think about is, you know, on the one hand, they're very simple. They're just a hole in space, but also they're extremely complex. And you can say, well, you know, in some sense what happens, and you know, this is not something I'm going to explain, but if you, uh, if you think about, uh, oops, if you think about uh, what black holes are, then the, you, you wonder, you know, how will they end? And, you know, how, what does matter do if it falls into a black hole? And so I just want to end by uh, showing the picture of this very famous scientist, Stephen Hawking, who did a lot of work on black holes. If you saw, the Nobel Prize in Physics was uh, awarded last year, uh, one half of it to uh, uh, the detection of the black hole in the Milky Way, but the other half was given to Roger Penrose, who was the collaborator, collaborator of Stephen Hawking. And together they proved in the 1960s that mathematically that these black holes really exist. So it's very unfortunate that Stephen Hawking passed away. In fact, uh, in, uh, in 2019, on the, on the very day uh, that uh, Albert Einstein was born, and uh, and so Stephen Hawking wasn't there when the first picture of a black hole was shown, and also he kind of basically just missed the Nobel Prize. So when the Nobel Prize was announced this year, I felt a little bit sad because I thought, you know, um, this would have been the year 2020 when Stephen Hawking might have been awarded the Nobel Prize. So when he passed away people took a little clip of his speech. And uh, I want to uh, um, play that for you. But they, they beamed that, that clip with radio waves and they beamed it to the closest black hole in our galaxy. And that black hole is, I think, 1,200 years, light years away. And so perhaps I think it's very fitting then the final words of Stephen Hawking that I'm now going to play for you are now underway towards 
a black hole. And this sort of final word is for Stephen Hawking. We are all time travelers journeying together into the future. But let us work together to make that future a place we want to visit. Be brave, be determined, overcome the odds. It can be done. Okay, so with uh, that, uh, I want to finish my presentation and open it for questions. If there's a black hole in the, our galaxy, then is there any chance that it'll actually swallow the Earth? Uh, no. So um, I think you know that's something that we... Uh, uh, let me stop uh, screen sharing. Let's see how I can do that. We are all time travelers. Oh. Uh, Turning together into the future. But let us work together to make that future. Okay. Where is everybody? Sure. Okay, great. So, <laughs> uh, so the question was, uh, what happens if, uh, if whether that a galactic black hole will ever swallow uh, the the sun? And uh, it will not. In fact, uh, you know, it will it will vacuum the the galactic center it will swallow some of the stars that are close to it but we are at a safe distance so i think most of the stars will just start keep on orbiting and you don't have to worry that we will be pulled in it's a little bit very similar that like the sun will not swallow us right because we have basically we're going fast enough to escape the gravitational pull i don't quite understand why not because uh the gravity field uh, does not stop at a certain point. And in billions of years, uh, the black hole eventually will attract all the stars, the planets of the Milky Way. Yeah, that's true. So if you take at a very, very long time where basically all the, st so first of all, like all our stars have to kind of uh, stop uh, radiating and they have to turn themselves in, into black holes and then the black holes will cluster. So if you look at the very, very far future of our universe, everything will end up in black holes. That's true. But in terms of capturing this black hole, capturing stars that are light, like our, uh, actually they, they, that will not happen. Other questions? And, yes. Um, can, in, what, what is holding the Milky Way together? Is it the black hole? No, so the Milky Way is held together in the same way as our solar system. So all the stars, they are orbiting. And so they have enough speed so that they can keep in their orbits. So they. Uh, basically, you can think of it that it's held together using gravity, but it's not that everything is being pulled in. So there are, it's, uh, it's, it's in principle a stable system. That's our, basically just as our solar system. Um, you know, we think that in the beginning, perhaps one or two planets might have escaped the solar system, but now every, everything is, uh, is pretty regular. Uh, if scientists used... Um radio waves to see, uh, um, like to get a picture of the black hole, then how come the radio waves weren't distorted by the fact that space is distorted around the black hole? In fact, they are distorted. And so if you uh, look at the shape of the, 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 the picture, you know, it's kind of interesting because we said that you know, even if it's a disk, remember the images from interstellar, right? So the lights, morph that disk into kind of a crazy shape. So in the same way, the, to compute the shape, the image that we actually observed, it's heavily warped by the gravitational field. So uh, that's why it was very difficult to compute in advance what the image of the black hole would look like because it's uh, these great, these, these radio waves are equally perturbed uh deformed uh, as visible light would be so it's uh if you actually would would be close to the black hole if you could 
imagine it, it's much more like a flat disk that's orbiting this sphere. But uh, what we see is something very different. Essentially what you see, because it's such a strong lens, that the matter that's behind the black hole, the light actually is able to go around the black hole and still come in our telescopes. So if, if, you, uh, if you yourself would be, you know, you basically, a black hole can see the, the back of its, of its hat because of its, uh, the funny way in which the, the radio waves travel. Yeah, so it's a, it was a very complicated calculation to uh, compute in advance. And as I showed with, when I painted my picture, that was actually using the scientific theory. And so we were really delighted when we saw the image that it exactly looked like we thought it would look like using our calculation. Okay, thank you. Just a quick question. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, do you think, I've heard this theory, but do you think that the visible universe could be inside a black hole? Sort of this holographic universe concept? Um, well, I th I, in principle, it could be, but it's, uh, it's um, so th I think there's a, it's a, there's a different uh, notion here. So, you know, there, the, we, we, we talked about the horizon of a black hole, you know, which is the area where you want to stay outside and it's the area where light can escape now if you have an expanding universe there is a, there's another problem uh you know, basically if the light is coming from something very far away since that part is expanding so fast that light will never reach us so in that sense there's again an event horizon in an expanding universe uh, but it shows uh basically it tells you that there is something really far away that you can never see. In the black hole, there's something inside the black hole that you can never see. So it's sometimes people say, well, it's a little bit, bit like we're inside the black hole, but it's, that's not quite true because inside the black hole, there's a singularity that pulls you in. There isn't a singularity, we're not being pulled in, but there are two ways in which event horizons uh, are created. One is in a black hole and we have seen images of it. The other way is essentially in an, in an exponentially expanding universe. And so we call that the cosmic horizon. And it just tells us that however long we wait, however strong our telescopes are, we can never see more than a certain depth in the universe. And that's why if we talk about the visible universe, the part that we can see, that's just a part of the universe and that will be forever our habitat. We will never, never go beyond that. Other questions? Um, the the, a red, the red, moon? Red. Um, is there heat inside a black hole? Is there what inside the black hole? Heat. Heat. Well, that's a very good question. Well, I think definitely yes. Well, of course, we don't know. But you can imagine, you know, all that matter that falls in to create a black hole once it goes through the horizon, it's still there. And when it gets closer and closer, it's being squeezed together. So I think, you know, inside the black hole, Sorry, I couldn't hear you. inside the black hole will be, you know, very hot and very violent. If that the black hole is that just formed, if it's a black hole that was there from the very beginning, it just could be empty. We don't know. But I think the black holes that we know, that, that stars that, that imploded or the ones in our galaxy, I think if you go inside, it's very hot, it's very violent. And, and by the way, you know, if you fall in, the gravitational force is so strong, it actually will make you uh, into spaghetti. So you're being, you're being pulled very thin. And, uh, so, and so you you'll be like spaghetti inside a very hot pan of tomato sauce. I think that's that's how you <laughs> you're inside the black hole. Excuse, excuse, yeah. Excuse me. I have uh, actually two questions, but the first is, uh, as you know, there are uh, kinds of black holes. We have we know warm holes and neutron stars. How can we differentiate between these kinds of uh, 
I mean, in term of detection, when we are trying to detect or to... So, in fact, the theory tells us that black holes are very simple. Um, they, there's literally a hole in space, and they're characterized by essentially two properties. One is their size. So, a black hole doesn't matter where it's made of, you know, it just knows its, its total weight. That's it. So, and the second thing is, is, is its rotation. So it can spin around. In fact, and, uh, we know that most black holes will spin around, just like the Earth is spinning, the Sun is spinning, the galaxy is spinning. Basically, everything in the universe is spinning. And probably it spins very fast. And by looking at these, gravitation, these gravitational waves of colliding black holes, we could not only calculate what the weight of the black hole is, its mass, but we can also see how fast it, co it can spin. Okay. And just imagine, so these black holes, they're spinning really, really fast. You know, there is a maximum speed in which a black hole can spin, which is the speed of light. So you should imagine that, uh, you know, at some point you said, well, you, see, you think of these black holes as being the size of a big city but you should think of this ball the size of a big city that's rotating almost with the speed of light so this is a really really frightening thing right so it, it uh you know, the speed of light is very fast you know uh if, if you uh wait a second you can go uh, around eight times around the, the earth so just imagine that you create a sphere the size of Manhattan, and you have it spinning around at the speed of light, is a very frightening thing. And so, uh, but the answer is, is these two numbers essentially completely determine what kind of black hole you have. Okay, thank you so much. And my second and last question is, uh, actually, I'm not a physics major student. I am doing mathematics, and they know the applications of math. But when I'm thinking about cosmology or astrophysics, I always think, or this question comes to my mind, what is the application? Where, I mean, in our daily life, should we use yes. this? Because this reminds me of a, a funny story. Uh, one, one, once uh, Queen Victoria went to, um, to the laboratory of uh, Michael Faraday and she asked him, what is the use of electricity? And she looked at, and he looked at her and he said, Madam, one day you will tax it. <laughs> so uh, maybe- Well, I think, you know, uh, will know the... I think there are two, two, two important things that we want to know. So first of all, I think, you know, why are we doing this? Because we want to understand what is the universe we are living in. We want to know why was it formed? Studying black holes is very similar to studying the Big Bang. So we learn a lot about why we're here. Uh, you know, what, the, what the, the nature of the universe are, what the fundamental forces are. But another thing that I really want to emphasize is what you saw today, you heard the sound, the weakest sound ever heard in the history of the planet. And you saw the image with the largest magnification ever made. We essentially use the planet to listen and we use the planet to look in the sky. So the technology knew, needed to do this and the amount of data that comes with it is extremely exciting. So you will not be surprised. There are many, many companies who really want to know, you know how can you do this? How can you store so much information? For instance, in order to use this virtual telescope that could look at the black hole, you had to measure the radio waves in all these locations. You had to do it at a height of four or five kilometers and very cold. And you, you, we, we used the latest kind of hard disk technology, internet technology that was only just available. So a lot of the things that we are using these days, connecting ourselves, connecting the world, is because we are now at the phase in science where our instruments are basically the size of the planet. So we are we're literally pushing here also technology as far as we can. So 
I think we will we'll see many, many applications in our everyday life uh, that will, will come out of this. But I think the real pleasure is knowing, uh, seeing the black holes. Uh, I like to say that, you know, uh, it's very rare that you have a big of science news that everybody knows about that's on the front page of every newspaper. And, you know, just the last year, the last few years, both the gravitational waves, the picture of the black hole, and the loss of Stephen Hawking, uh, all three appeared on the front page of every newspaper uh, that I've seen. And I think so, one thing that it does, it, you know, it triggers the imagination. So uh, I think that actually is a very good moment for me to end. Uh, I'm sure there are millions of questions. Um, you, know, you, you can always you know, send them to the Institute and I will look at that. Uh, I just want to thank all of you for attending today. And you know, uh, this is really exciting work. And, and, and I want to, to tell the, the children in particular, now, Albert Einstein thought of all of this 100 years ago. Now he already, he passed away in 1955. You know, Stephen Hawking thought about this. He's no longer with us. This is all happening in your time. You know, so you are living in an extremely exciting period of science where major breakthroughs are being made. And so you should feel very excited about what we have seen, what we have heard, what we can understand. But I think there's much more to become. And I think you know, we can all look for the next uh, next discovery. And if you want, if you say, well, is there something I can look forward to? I think that you no, know, we'll probably this year, we're going to see a picture of a second black hole, namely the black hole in the center of our own Milky Way. And you know, that will be really exciting because that black hole, I think what the, the scientists want to do, they don't want to shoot a picture of that black hole they actually want to shoot a movie of that black hole because that black hole is moving very fast. So who knows, perhaps this year, we see the first movie of a black hole and that would be again, you know, very exciting. So I thank you all. Thank you for attending and uh, have a wonderful weekend.